Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Raconteur and welcome back to the library. I'd like to share a few thoughts on the Books of Jacob by Olga Tokarczuk. Uh, this is a fascinating book. It is incredibly dense, nearly a thousand pages long, but I absolutely loved it. Uh, it is a feast of a novel. It is filled with ideas, characters, historical personages, and history, uh, religious uh, questions, religious enigmas, philosophy. It is just an enormous and, and overwhelming at times book. Uh, that I was fascinated by. I think uh, as a feast though, it is perhaps too overwhelming for some readers. It is one of those week-long wedding feasts that leaves the reader just a little worn down by the end. Uh, but there's much to enjoy, much to savor in these pages. And I want to open with the way that Tucker Chuk closes this masterpiece. She writes, any person who toils over matters of messiahs, even failed ones, even just to tell their stories, will be treated just the same as he who studies the eternal mysteries of light. <laughs> and those eternal mysteries, those messianic figures, those fascinate Tokarczuk. We have Jacob Frank, a true historical messianic figure in the second half of the 18th century, as the, the Jacob of the books of Jacob. Uh, and and Tokarczuk is fascinated by this man who, who cultivated a, a fascinating syncretic religious movement that had a very devoted following that traveled throughout different parts of uh, Eastern Europe into what was then the Ottoman Empire, across Western Ukraine, Poland, um, even farther west into Vienna. And Targarchuk is, is fascinated by Jacob Frank and also his daughter, Eva, who is a subsequent successor messiah, one of the first uh, female messiah figures that we have in history. And yet Targarchuk is, is not so focused on the Franks, that she forgets everyone around them. She is perhaps even more fascinated by all of the individuals around them. Who, uh, who was the rabbi whose family Jacob Frank married into? And what was his family like? What was his life like? Uh, who, who are the relatives from that side? What, what were the lives like for the, for the first people who followed Jacob Frank, uh, Naaman in particular? What, was his, what, was, what were his experiences? What was it like to be someone who was, in a sense, an ambassador for, for a, a messianic figure. Uh, how, how are these individuals interacting with the successors of the uh, renowned uh, Shabbatai Zevi and the previous messianic figure? How, what are all of these interactions later on with Habsburg emperors? And so the, the book as a whole is just incredible. And yet uh, the, there are so many wonderful ironies that exist within it. It, it is very much a, a book that feels so close to those enormous worlds created by the great 19th century novelists, whether it's Tolstoy, whether it's George Eliot, um, Dickens certainly comes to mind, the, the works of Jane Austen, the, the way that they try to, to populate these worlds and just fill them with people, with, with people who feel so real and authentic. Uh, it, it has all of those trademarks. Victor Hugo is particularly with Le Miserable. And yet the novel feels firmly embedded in the 21st century. There are these modern ironies that exist, this, this perspective um, that is at times humorous, but at times very tragic. And, and that irony, I think, helps the novel continually feel modern and fresh. In, in some ways, it, it did remind me of Thomas Pynchon's Against the Day. It was less silly. It was perhaps a bit more serious. Uh, there, there weren't wordplay jokes going on nonstop. But, but the way in which there's this great appreciation for the, the true history and yet this appreciation that, you know, fiction rescues history from its confusions and that, that there, there is a sense of humor there, but particularly with stories around individuals who uh, were Jewish in the 18th century and their experiences, the, the type of anti-Semitism and oppression they experienced, and ultimately what happened 150 years later in the Holocaust. Tokarczuk doesn't shy away from that. She doesn't belabor those points, but, but she's willing to no, make notes and, and extend the thread into the future far enough to say this book that is mentioned, that, that someone wrote and, and passed on to a you know, Catholic bishop there in Poland, uh, ultimately that, that copy of that book was burned during the Warsaw Uprising, during the Holocaust. Uh, she, she makes note of, of the experiences, the, the ways in which Jewish individuals in the rural villages uh, existed and, and the way that um, they were in a sense ostracized by so many and how that affected families. What, what does it mean to be a person who is ostracized from so many societies, so many aspects of society uh, because one's family is Jewish 
And then to join this movement, the, the Frankist movement, the Jacob Frank movement, and to now be ostracized as well by the Jewish community and, and the Talmudists, as they're referred to. And, and she digs into those experiences, you know, people who've lost their homes, people who carry what, what few belongings they have on their backs and travel across Eastern Europe. And she, and she really recreates those experiences and, and allows us to get this sense of humanity um, and get this sense of humor, but also a sense of horror across those experiences. And so it's an incredibly effective book. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, there are little diagrams and, and pictures and maps embedded in the pages. And, you know, those, those add this wonderful detail, this, this sort of verisimilitude. There are pages that recreate different um, poems. There are pages that are, are uh, uh, written out as the scraps by name in one of the key followers of Jacob. And uh, there are pages that are letters between different characters. And so all of those different types of documents uh, lend this sense of authenticity to the book as a whole. And it reminded me of the beginning of Shadow Country by Peter Matheson, the way that he has all these other characters telling us what's going on without ever really getting in the mind of the main character. And that's true in a sense with the books of Jacob. Takachuk doesn't really let us into Jacob Frank's mind. We don't get to understand his perspective of what it means to, to be a messianic figure. We're rather spending time with everyone around him and trying to fill in all of these other pieces of the puzzle uh, to perhaps get a glimpse of, of how each of them perceive Jacob Frank. Uh, and I think there is perhaps this metaphor of the way that um, people try to contextualize their ideas around their belief in God or their, their lack of belief in a God or, or a higher power or a specific Messiah. And, um, and I think that that was happening across the books of Jacob as well. Uh, there, there are ways in which it acts almost as an inversion of the Cromwell trilogy by Hilary Mantel. And in those books, we, we get this enormous detailed panorama of to, you know, the court of Henry VIII and, and Europe at that time from the mind of Thomas Cromwell. It's all filtered through his mind. And here we have the opposite of that. We have this enormous panorama. We have all of these details. We have all these experiences. And yet it's from everyone's mind except that of the central figure. Um, and so that inversion, I think, I think worked really well. I think people who enjoyed those books um, and, and found their curiosity sort of piqued by those novels could perhaps appreciate the books of Jacob from, from that sense and that perspective. Another writer I was reminded of was the, the many, many wonderful stories of Isaac Bashevis Singer. And he was, was often set his stories later than the 18th century that we have here in the books of Jacob. And yet it, it's fascinating to see how, in a sense, how little has, had changed in the intervening 150 years between 1750 and 1900 in the, uh, in, in the small rural Jewish villages of Poland, of Ukraine, of the Russian Empire, as, as uh, Isaac Bishop Singer was writing. And to, to see those interesting contrasts was, was, and the, the pieces that still felt so similar on many pages. Uh, and so it was a book, again, that I really enjoyed. I would encourage folks to check it out, but, but understand what you're getting into. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not one where every question is going to be answered. It is not one... Uh, it is not a book that necessarily feels triumphant in many ways, it, 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 but it, it's a really wonderful and, and fascinating book. And I'd be curious to know what others thought of it. I'd be curious to know uh, how much others enjoyed it, if you enjoyed it as I did. Um, but I, I would not maybe perhaps say make this your first experience with uh, Tucker Chuk. Flights is... Um, probably more experimental than the books of Jacob, but it's also much shorter and it is uh, focused on more, more modern ideas. And um, from what I understand, I haven't read it yet, but drive, uh, drive your plow bones, drive your plow over the bones of the dead. Uh, seems like a very, a, a book that feels a little bit perhaps closer to this, uh, but again, is much shorter. So perhaps check one of those out before diving into the books of Jacob. Uh, but this translation from Jennifer Croft was very good. <laughs> so I hope everybody's doing well. Thank you.